Uh, my name is Pierre Etienne Meunier. I work on uh, way too many projects at the same time. Right now, I'm working on Coternix, which is a, a way to share renewable electricity with your neighbors efficiently and using mathematics to do that. And I've been working for uh, a few years now on Pirul, which is a, a version, the version control system based also on mathematics that uh, I'm going to talk about today. So I have way too many things to tell you. I'll start with talking about what version control is and do a brief recap on uh, like where it comes from, how it started, where we're at now. Then I'll talk about our solution, uh, Pirul, uh, and the principles behind it. Uh, and then I'll talk about uh, implementation uh, of, of that version control system, including one of the uh, fastest database backends uh, in the world that I've been forced to write in order to uh, implement Pirul correctly. And then finally, I'll have uh, uh, some, some announcements, some surprise announcement to make about uh, the ho uh, hosting platform to host uh, repositories. So first, version control is actually very simple. And it's not, it's not specific to, to, uh, to uh, coders. It's when one or more, more co-authors edit a tree of documents concurrently. And one key feature of version control compared to things like Google Docs, for example, is the ability to do asynchronous edits. So this sounds like it's, it, it should be uh, easier uh, when, when, you're doing, when you're going uh, asynchronous because uh, you're giving more flexibility to your users, but it's actually the opposite. So when you allow co-authors to choose when they want to sync or uh, merge their, uh, their uh, changes or their, their uh, work, then uh, things become much more complicated. Uh, the main reason is because edits may conflict. And, and there, there are, like, conflicts happen in, in, uh, in human work. Like when, when I, I don't have, I, I'm not claiming here to have a universal solution to uh, all conflicts humans, humans may have. Um, but I'm merely trying to uh, help them model their conflicts in a proper way. And then finally, another, like not, not finally, but uh, yet another uh, feature of version control that we might like is to be able to review a project's history to tell when uh, a feature or when a bug was introduced, who introduced it, and uh, sometimes that gives indication on how to fix it. So many of you here, or many people I talk to about this project, think uh, that version control is a solved problem uh, because our tools like Git, Mercurial, SVN, CVS, uh, people sometimes mention Fossil, Perforce, like we have a huge collection of tools. But they, the, our tools, like we're, they're, they're probably considered one of the greatest achievements of our, of our industry, and yet there, nobody outside of us uses them. So these days we have silverware provided by uh, NASA uh, with materials that can go on Mars, but um, our greatest achievements cannot be used even by uh, editors of legal documents or uh, parliaments, or any, and even, even the video game industry doesn't use them. So it's not because they're, they're too young. Uh, they have been around for quite, quite a number of decades now. Um, lately, there's been a trend of doing distributed version controls. So that's cool. There's no, no, cent no central, central server, except that the tools are unusable if you don't use a, a central server. And even actually worse, or, well, uh, <laughs> sorry, uh, worse than a central server, a global central server universal to all projects. And uh, our current tools require strong work discipline and, and planning. You have to plan your, your uh, things in advance. So the picture on the right is a simple example of a workflow considered useful, uh, and I personally don't understand it. Um, well, I actually do, but, um, but, but yeah, onboarding people and letting like p diverse people uh, from outside of, like without, for example, a formal training in computer science, uh, know about, uh, about this tool, they'll be like, oh, are you crazy or what? And, that's just a, a small part of, of what I'm, I'm, I'm about to say, because there's flaws that any other, any engineer in any other industry in the world would just laugh at us if they knew about that. And so my claim is that uh, by using these tools, we are wasting significant human work time at a global scale. I don't know how many millions of engineer hours are wasted every year into fixing that rebase that didn't work, or refixing that conflict again, or uh, wait, wait, re-refixing it, or I don't know, re-re-refixing uh, it. There's actually a command in, in, in Git called re 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 um, uh, some improvements have been proposed using, uh, using uh, mathematics, physics, uh, like darks, for example. But unfortunately, they don't really scale. Uh, well, just a note before I go any further, it's like Pirul is open source. And I, I'm, I'm not considering uh, non-open source version control systems because 
Git, Git is good enough. Uh, it's, it's an okay system. It's, it, it's f f uh, phenomenal in some ways. But uh, well, if you if you're going for a commercial system, uh, then you'd better be at least as good as that. So, and I don't know any system that achieves that. Anyway, so our demands um, for a version control system. So we want associative merges. So we want like, what what that means in so associativity is a mathematical term. And it means that when you take changes A and B together. They should be the same as A followed by B. So that sounds like something absolutely trivial. And I'll give you a picture in a minute you'll, uh, that, that'll make it even clearer. Next, we want commutative merges. So we want the property that if A and B can be produced independently, they are ordered, the order in which you apply them doesn't matter. If you have Alice and Bob working together, if Alice pulls Bob's changes, it should result in the same thing as if uh, Bob pulls Alice, Alice's changes. Then we want branches, or, or maybe not. Uh, uh, we have branches in Pihul, but they are less fundamental than in, in Git, to, in order not to uh, uh, do the same kind of uh, workflows considered useful that I showed in the previous slide. And obviously, we want low algorithmic complexity, and ideally, fast implementations. And actually, here we have both. So more about uh, like the two properties, uh, starting with associ associative merges. So this is really easy. So this is like you have Alice producing a, a comet A, and Bob producing a comet B in parallel. And Alice wants to first review Bob's first comet, merge it, and then review Bob's second comet and merge it. And this should do the same as if she uh, had merged both comets at the same, uh, like at once. I'm not reordering comets here. I'm just merging. And actually in Git, or SVN, or Mercurial, or CVS, or CS, or like any system based on freeware merge, this is not the case. Uh, such a simple property isn't even, um, isn't even satisfied by, by, by freeware merge. So here's an example of why. It's a counter example of the associativity of Git. So you start with a, a document with only two lines, A and B. Um, Alice, is, she's following the top path. She will start by introducing a, a G, and then she will later uh, add another comet with two new lines above that G, A and B. And Bob, in parallel to that, will just add an X between the original A and B. And if you try that, uh, if you tried that scenario on Git today, you will see that Bob's new line is uh, like gets merged into Alice's new lines. So that's a giant line reshuffling happening, and Git do just does that silently. Uh, so this, is, this isn't even a conflict. The reason for that is that it's trying to run a hack uh, to optimize some metric, and uh, it turns out there may be several uh, solutions sometimes, and it just doesn't know about them. It just picks one and says, ah, okay, done. So I don't know about you, but if I were running high security uh, applications, and if I were writing code related to security, this would absolutely terrify me. So the fact that your tool can just silently reshuffle your lines, um, even if it doesn't happen often, uh, it's just super scary. Uh, it also means that the code you review is not the code that gets merged. So you should review your, your, uh, your pull request before merge and after merge. So that's double the work. Well, you should test them after merge anyway, but you shouldn't be as careful in your review and tests don't catch all bugs. Now, commutative merges, that's a slightly less trivial thing, because all, all the tools other than Darks and, and Pihul um, explicitly prevent that. So commutative merges means exactly what's in this diagram. You have Alice producing a comet A, Bob producing a comet or a change B, and then they want to be able to pool each other's changes, and it should ju just happen transparently uh, and without without anything special happening. And they should, like, the order should, the order is important, because obviously your local, local repository history is something super important. But it shouldn't matter in the sense that, um, like, the, there, should, there, there, there is no global way to order things that happen in parallel. So, uh, so that's, this should be reflected in, in how the tool handles uh, parallelism. All right, so why, do we, why would we even want that uh, beyond just academic curiosity? Because our, the tools we're we currently using right now uh, are never commutative, and they explicitly prevent that. So why would we want, want, want this? Well, one reason would be that you might want to unapply all changes. For example, you pull the change um, and then went on, like you, you, or you push the change into, into production um, because you've you tested it thoroughly and it seemed to work. Then you push more changes. 
And then after a while, you realize that your initial change was wrong, and you want to unpull it quickly uh, without having to change the entire, uh, the entire sequence of patches that came afterwards. So you might be able to, to you, you, might, you, want, you, you might want to be able to do that. And uh, well, if you, if you disallow uh, commutation, you can't. And here, uh, commutativity allows you to like, change that, like uh, move that change, that, that buggy change to uh, the uh, uh, la latest, uh, like to the, top of the, uh, to the top of the list, and, and then unapply it simply. Then you might want to do uh, cherry picking. So cherry picking is like, oh, my colleague produced a nice, uh, a nice bug fix while working on feature. Uh, I want that bug fix, but the feature is not quite ready. So how do I do that? Without changing the entire identity uh, and solving conflicts and resolving them and re-resolving them and re-re-resolving them. So another reason uh, I might want that is because I, I want partial clones. So I have a giant mono repo, and I want to pull just those patches related to tiny sub-projects. And so that's the way we handle mono repos in Pihul. And you don't need sub-modules, you don't need hacks, you don't need LFS, you don't need any of that. It just, it just works. And it's just the standard situation. OK, so how do we do that? Um, well, first, we have to change perspective and take some, uh, like, unzoom un un uh, the, 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 the space. And, 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 and try to look at what we're doing fundamentally. Uh, what, what's, what is it that we're doing when we work? Um, so we'll start talking about states or snapshots and changes, also called patches sometimes. So all our tools today are storing states, snapshots. And they only compute changes when needed. Like, for example, three-way merge computes changes and changes between lists of changes. But now, what if we did the opposite? What, what is, if we changed perspective and started considering uh, changes as, as first-class citizens? Why would we want to do that? Well, because my claim is, and it's not backed by anything, but my claim is that when we work, what we're fundamentally producing is not a new version of the world, what we, or a new version of a project. When we work, what we're producing is changes to a project. And so th this seems to match the way we work or, or the way we think about work closer. And so it probably will be able to get some benefits out of that. And so now, what if we did a hybrid system where we stored both? It actually, I, that's actually what we do. All right, so this has been looked at before. Um, I'll just give you two examples of, of uh, ideas in, the, in that space that some of you may already know about. So the first one is operational transforms. That's the idea behind uh, Google Docs, for example. So in Google Docs, like, this, is, this is an example. So in operational transforms, you have transforms and or, or uh, changes on, on, a, on a, an initial state here, uh, a document with three letters, A, B, C. And then what you do in operational transforms is that when you have two, changes, two, two transforms coming in concurrently, um, you they, they might change each other in order to be, to be able to apply them in a sequence. So for example, here um, on the path down, downwards, we're, 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 we're uh, inserting an X at the very beginning of the file. So that's change T1. And on the path to the right, we're doing T2, which deletes the letter C. And what happens when you combine these two changes? Well, if you follow the path on the top, you're, you're first deleting the C. And then while T1 was at the beginning of the file, so you don't need to do anything, because uh, your previous change, uh, the, de the deletion, changed the, uh, the end of the file. So that's OK. No, nothing, nothing special going on there. On the other path, uh, going first downwards and then to the right, you have to, uh, well, you f you're first inserting something, and then that, um, that shifts, shifts the index of your deletion. So now you're, instead of deleting the character that was at uh, position uh, two, you're deleting the character that's at posi position three. So Darks, for example, does this. Uh, it changes, uh, it, cha it, edit, like, it changes uh, uh, patches as, 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 it, uh, as it goes. And it actually do, does something really clever to detect conflicts. They don't have time to uh, get into the detail, details, but that's what, you're, what they're doing there is really cool. Um, unfortunately, this technique le leads to a quadratic explosion of cases, because for if you have like n different types of changes, you have n times n minus 1 over 2 uh, different cases to consider. And when you're just doing insertions and, and deletions, that's easy. When you're doing anything uh, worse than that or more, more complicated, that's, that becomes a nightmare to implement. And I'm actually here, I'm, I'm quoting, uh, like saying a nightmare to implement is actually a quote by uh, Google engineers who uh, tried to uh, implement that for, for uh, Google Docs. So, so it actually is a nightmare. 
Um, all right, uh, an, another approach that uh, some of you may have heard about is CRDTs, or conflict-free replicated data types. The general principle is to design a structure and operations at the same time together so that all operations have the properties we want. So they are associative, commutative. Natural examples, and the, the easiest examples uh, that you might come across when you're learning about CRDTs are increment-only counters, where the only operation on the counter is just to increment it, and insert-only uh, sets or append-only sets. So these are easy. Now, what happens when you want to do deletions? Then you get into the more subtle examples of CRDTs. Then you start needing uh, uh, tombstones and uh, Lamport clocks and all these things uh, from uh, distributed programming. And so I've done the natural, the subtle. Now let's move on to the useless. Um, if you consider a full Git repository, that's a CRDT. So what are we even doing here? Um, well, the thing is, why, why my claim is why, why I claim this is useless is because saying a Git repository is a CRDT just means that you can clone it and you can design a protocol to clone it, and and that's just it. Um, now, if you just if you consider head, which is the thing we're interested in, which is the current state of your repository, then that's not a CRDT. That's like absolutely not one. Uh, simply because, as I said, uh, concurrent changes don't commute. So. That was like a really brief recap of the literature on uh, that thing. Now let's move on to uh, uh, our, our solution, or Pihul. So this all started because we were looking at conflicts. And because the easy cases, the cases where you can just merge and everything uh, goes, goes right, then that's not super interesting. So what happens when you look at conflicts where that's where we need a good tool the most, because co conflicts are confusing and you want to be able to just talk about the fundamental things behind the conflict, like we disagree on something, and, and not about how your tools resolve, like model the conflict. So the exact definition depends on the tool. Uh, different tools have different definitions of what a, what a conflict is. So for example, one commonly accepted definition is that when Alice and Bob write to the same file at the same place, so that's obviously conflict. There's no way to order their, uh, their, uh, their changes. Another example is when Alice renames a file from F to G, and Bob in parallel renames it to uh, H. So that's also a conflict, but again, that depends on the tool. Uh, another example, which actually very few systems handle, and, and Pihul doesn't handle it, uh, that's when Alice renames a function F while Bob call, adds a call to F. So that's extremely tricky. Uh, Darks tries to do that. Unfortunately, uh, it's undecidable to tell whether Bob actually added a call to F or did something else. So that's one of the reasons we don't handle this. Uh, there's also many other reasons, but that's a good enough reason for me. Okay, so how do we how do we do that? So why are reflection and conflicts helped us shape a new tool? Because we were inspired by a paper by uh, Samuel Mimram and Cynthia Di Giusto about uh, using category theory to solve that problem. So category theory is a very general theory in mathematics that allows you to uh, model many different kinds of proofs uh, in this particular 2D framework with points and arrows between, between the points. That's, that's most of what we have in category theory. It's, a very, it's, it's very, uh, very simple and very abstract at the same time. So what we want is that for any two patches, F and G, uh, produced from uh, an initial state X, so F leads to Y and G uh, uh, leads to Z, we want a state P and we want a unique state P such that anything we do in the future, so for any state Q that we can reach after both F and G, so for anything Alice and Bob could do to reach a common state in the future, they could start by uh, merging now, reaching uh, a minimal common state uh, P, and then uh, and then they can reach Q. So we, we, what we want is that for any two patches, uh, you can start by finding a minimal common state and, and, then, and then doing something to reach uh, any other future common states. So I realize I'm going a bit fast on this slide, but um, category theorists have the tool to handle that. Uh, they, they say that if P exists, uh, which implies its uniqueness, we call P the pushout of F and G. So why is, why is this important? Well, because as you can uh, imagine, pushouts, like, uh, it's not that simple. So pushouts don't always exist. And this is, abs this is strictly equivalent to saying that sometimes uh, there are conflicts in, in between our uh, edits. So how do we, how do we uh, deal with that? 
then, then well, category theory tells you that the question, like, gives you a new question to look at. So now the question becomes how to generalize the representation of states. So states are like x, y, uh, z, or p, or q, so that all pairs of changes like f and g uh, have a pushout. Well, the solution is that uh, your the, the minimal, like the, the minimal um, extension of, of files that can tolerate conflict, so that's what we're actually looking at. So the minimal extension of files that can model conflict is um, uh, directed graphs, where vertices are bytes, or byte intervals, and edges represent the union of all known order between bytes. So I know that so probably sounds a little abstract, but I'll, I'll give you a few examples. So for example, let's let's see how we uh, how we deal with uh, bytes, with insertions. Like, let's add some bytes to an existing file. So, um, well, first, some details. So vertices in Pihul are uh, labeled by a change number. Uh, that's the, the, the change that introduced, the, introduced the, the, the vertex. And an interval within that change. And edge, edges are labeled by the change that introduced them. So for example, here, we're starting with just one vertex, uh, C0, 0N. So that's the first N bytes in uh, change C0. And we're, we're trying to insert uh, m bytes between positions i minus 1 and i of uh, that vertex. So what we do is we start by splitting the vertex, and so we get two vertices, c0, 0i, and c0, in. And now we're inserting a new vertex uh, between these two uh, halves of the split. So that's super easy. And now we can, we, can, we can tell from that graph that our file has uh, three blocks. So one is the first i bytes of c0, uh, followed by the first m bytes of c1, and then uh, some bytes in, in c0, so bytes i, I, I to n. OK, so uh, that was easy enough. So now how do we delete bytes? Well, a good thing about version control is that we need to uh, keep the history of the entire repository anyway. So it doesn't cost, cost more to, uh, to just uh, keep, the, keep the deleted parts. So that's what we do here. So starting from the, the graph we obtained in the last slide, what I'm doing is uh, I'm, I'm now deleting bytes like a contiguous interval, uh, bytes first j to i from c0 and then 0 to k from c1. So that's bytes uh, starting from uh, j and then uh, i minus j plus k. Uh, I'm deleting i minus j plus k bytes from that from there. So the way I do I do it is exactly the same thing, the same way as as for insertions. I start by splitting my vertices, splitting the relevant vertices at the relevant position, positions, and, and then the way to mark them as deleted is just um, is just uh, modifying the, the the label of the edges. So here I'm marking my edges as deleted by uh, turning them into dashed dashed lines, and and that's all we need. That's that's it. So the pihul is not more complicated. Well, it's a bit more complicated than that. But that's fundamentally the, the, that these are the two constructs we uh, we need. And then there's a lot of stuff above above that. But that's a like a, the very basic. The very basic is just just that. So add the vertex in the context. The context are parents and children of the vertex. Then change change an edges label. So um, how does that handle conflict? I won't dive into that too uh, too too deep. Uh, for uh, reasons of time, but I'll just state the definition of conflicts, and I'll, I'll stop there. So, um, the like first between getting to, before getting into conflicts, first alive vertices. I call alive vertices. That's the definition. Uh, there are vertices whose incoming edges are all alive, and dead vertices are vertices whose incoming edges are all dead, and all the other vertices. So vertices that have uh, both alive and dead uh, uh, edges pointing to them. They're called zombies. And now I'm ready to state my definition of conflicts. So a graph has no conflicts if and only if it has no zombie and all its alive vertices are totally ordered. So that's, that's my definition of conflict. And, and actually, it actually matches what you expect. So that's just a, a, a sequence of bytes that's, that can be ordered um, unambiguously. And uh, it can be, you can tell for each byte that it is either alive or dead, but both at the same time. And well, there's an extension to that, uh, an extension of that to uh, uh, files and directories and so on. But that's uh, that's uh, uh, significant, significantly more involved. So I won't talk about that. Okay. So um, just some concluding remarks on, on that part. Uh, changes are 
So I said I, I wanted them to be commutative. So I, I, I can get that uh, using, using this, uh, this uh, framework. Uh, they're not completely commutative in the sense that changes are partially ordered by their dependencies on other changes. So each change has um, encodes explicitly a number of uh, uh, dependency like dependencies uh, that are required in order to apply the change. Like for example, you, can, you cannot um, write to a file before uh, introducing that file, or you cannot delete a line that uh, doesn't exist yet. So that's like basic dependencies. So now cherry picking, well, there's no, there's, there, there isn't even a cherry pick command in Pihul because cherry picking is the same as applying a patch. We don't need to do anything special. There's no git ra ra ra. So git ra 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 is about uh, solving a conflict, like having to solve a conflict several times. I don't know if many of you have, have used that command. But uh, the goal of rah, 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 I think it's somewhat automated now, but the goal is like once you've solved the conflict, you record the conflict resolution and then try maybe if Git allows to maybe replay it sometime in, sometimes in the future if it works and it doesn't always work. So now conflicts are just like the normal case and they're solved by changes and changes can be cherry picked. So if you've solved the conflict in one context, you don't need to solve it again in another context. Um, for partial clones and mono repos, so I already mentioned that, but there's, uh, they're easy to implement as long as wide patches are disallowed. So, for example, if you do a global reformatting, like a patch, a patch that reformats all um, all of your repository at once. Well, I don't know who would want to do that, but if you do that, obviously, then you introduce dependencies, like unwanted dependencies between changes. So, if you want to do this global reformatting, one thing you can do is just just make like one patch by uh, one reformatting patch by uh, by a sub project. And then you can uh, uh, keep going. For large files, um, well, one thing I haven't meant, like I haven't really talked about uh, in detail, is um, the way we handle large files is that, like patches, patches are actually have two parts in Pihol. Uh One part is the description of what they do, so insert, inserting some bytes, deleting some bytes, and the other thing is uh, the actual bytes that are uh, inserted or deleted. And the way we handle large files is by uh, splitting patches into the description of what they do, and that's uh, like the operational part, and the and the, the actual contents. And the operational part can be exponentially smaller than the actual contents. So, for example, if uh, one of your if you work at a video game company and uh, one of your artists has produced ten versions of a two gigabyte assets during the day. You don't need to. You don't need to download all all twenty or, or all ten versions. You only need to download the bytes that end up being still alive at the end of the day. So that allows you to just handle large files easily. Um, While well, you still need to download some some content, but much less content than deleting all the versions. All right. So let's move on to uh, some implementation tricks and some like cool like some things I like. Like there's lot there's a lot to say about implementation, but. I'm just going to tell you about some things I, I like and some things I'm proud of in, in the implementation of this system. Um, the, main, the main challenge was working with large graphs on disk. So obviously, when you're doing any uh, kind of like more complicated data structure than just uh, files, the question arises of, of how you should store them uh, on disk so that you don't have to load the entire thing each time, because that would be like the, the, the cost would be pro proportional to the size of history. And that's just unacceptable. So we want it to be actually logarithmic in the size of history, and that's what we achieve. So we can we cannot load the entire graph each time. So we have to keep it on disk and and manipulate it from there. So the trick is to store edges in a key value store. So vertices and edges. Vertices mapping to uh, uh, their uh, edges to their uh, surrounding ed edges. Um, another thing we absolutely want is uh, transactions. So we want passive crash safety. Uh, if, like the goal with Pihul is to be much more intuitive than anything else than all the existing tools. Um, my goal is to introduce it to lawyers, artists, um, maybe Lego builders or uh, Sonic Pi uh, composers or uh, the, 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 these kinds of people. And uh, these people cannot tolerate. Uh, non like active crash safety they don't they, they cannot possibly uh they cannot possibly tolerate like some operation on the log that should be done after you've unplugged the machine for example or after a crash happens so we absolutely want that and next another feature is that we want uh branches so they're not as uh useful as in as in git but st we still want them 
Uh, and so we want an efficiently forkable store. So we want to be able to take uh, a, dat a database and then just clone it without copying a single byte. And so in order to solve these problems, I've written a library called Sanakiria. So this is a Finnish word uh, meaning dictionary. And it's a non-disk transactional key value store, but it's not just that. Actually, it's a more like a general purpose file block allocator. So it, it's, um, uh, it allocates blocks in the file in a transactional way. So if you unplug the machine at any time, but I really do mean any time, um, your, your, all your allocations will go away and memory will be automatically freed. And so it uses crash safety using referential transparency and copy and write tricks. So it never modifies the previous version, it just creates a new version. And with, that comes at uh, no cost because you don't, because you, you, already, like, you already need to, so when, when you're wor working with disk, uh, with disk files, you, you already need to read them. And so this is such an expensive operation that uh, just a few copies, even like one, I do only one copy at most, but just a few copies each time you read a, a block from a file don't cost anything more than uh, just, like don't, co don't cost, like the, the cost of that is just negligible com compared to uh, the cost of reading, uh, reading a block. Um, it's forkable in big O of log n, but log n is like an approximation. It's an a the absolute worst case is logarithmic in the size, in the total number of keys and values. And it's written in Rust, which might make some of you feel that it's probably safe to use and so on, but it, act it's act it actually uses a super tricky API because it's way too generic and it's actually super hard to use. And anyone, wa anyone who wants to uh, use Sanakiria often has to write a, a layer on top of it. Uh, in order to just provide uh, the normal uh, safety guarantees that we might want from uh, a Rust library. And it uses a generic underlying storage layer. So I can store stuff in an, in an mmap file, uh, but I can also do my uh, read and writes uh, independently, individually, and manually. Um, or I can, do, I can use a IO U-ring, like the new fancy uh, uh, IO system in Linux. Or I can do, well, other things I'll talk about in uh, the rest of, the, of this talk. So now, just a, a really brief, um, uh, like a really brief uh, d description of how I, like how, like just, I, I won't, okay, just a really brief description of how I, how I manage crash safety using, uh, using this system and using multiple B trees and roots. So B trees are these magical data structure that, um, always stay balanced without having to do anything special. Uh, the reason is that in a B tree insertions, so they are a search tree with more than just one element in, uh, in, each, in each node. So there can be, usually there's like my nodes, for example, in uh, Sanakiria are limited to, their, to the size of one memory page or one uh, disk um, a sector, so four kilobytes. And I store as many keys and values as I can in, in these blocks. So here, for the sake of this example, I've just limited my uh, block size to just two elements to, to, keep the, to keep the picture simple. So for example, let's say I want to insert uh, a five. Uh, so I first, I, I, I first start by uh, deciding where I want to insert it. So routing from the top. Um, like I, I know I need to insert it between, between three and seven because five is between, between three and seven. Uh, so I go down to this children, to this child. And now I know that um, I need to insert the five between the four and six. So this node is already full because I told you the limit is uh, two elements. So this causes a split in this node. So now I get two uh, blocks, two, uh, two uh, leaves, four and six. And I wasn't able to insert the five in any of them. So this means that I have to insert it uh, in the parent, so between the three and seven. But then again, that node is full. It's, it's already at maximum capacity, so I need to uh, split it. And now this is what I get. And so this, this is magical and because it's, super, it's a super simple way of uh, doing insertions that keep the tree balanced. Because the only way the depth can increase is by splitting the root. And this gives you automatically the guarantee that all uh, paths will have the same length. So I really love that idea. It's one of the oldest data structures, uh, but it's still really cool and it's very suitable for storing stuff on disk. Uh, so now, just a bit about uh, crash safety and how, how we do, how we use that uh, to, uh, to uh, keep our uh, data safe. 
The way we do it is by having uh, a number of sectors at the beginning of the file, pointing each to one copy of, of the entire database. So for example, here, uh, in, in the first page, I'm pointing to the old version of uh, my, my B tree, which is this version here. And on the next one, I'm building the new version by modifying some stuff. Uh, and and um, the new version, well, I don't have to, to just to copy everything. I can just I, I can just copy just the bits I did. And, and the old, uh, it will share uh, most of its, like everything that hasn't been modified will be shared with the previous version. So that's, that's all we do. And so what happens when you unplug the machine at any time really, uh, well, that part will not get written. Like the, the, the pages at the beginning of the file will not get written. And so nothing will happen. The, the, the uh, allocations will uh, get back to what they were before you started the transaction. And the, the, the commit of a transaction actually happens when we're uh, changing the first eight bytes of the file. So uh, hard drives usually guarantee that you can write a full sector. They have a, a little battery inside that um, uh, keeps going to write at least like one full sector. But often they tell you, well, it's best efforts. So there's no actual guarantee that they do that. So they guarantee it, but with no actual guarantee. I don't really know what that means. But what I know is that um, writing eight bytes should be OK. So if they try to do best effort for uh, 4,096 bytes, then probably there's eight bytes. They, they, can, they can certainly do it with high probability. Another uh, feature of this system is that writers don't block readers because the old versions are still available. So if you start a transaction while uh, a read-only transaction while you're uh, uh, writing uh, writing writing something, you can still read the old version, and so that's that's really cool as well. It's not super useful in in Pirul. Um, well, unless you start running Pirul in the cloud, as I'll show you in a minute. And well, this sounds like su something su super uh, fancy and with lots of like. Redundancy, crash safety, copy and write, and it should, should be super expensive. But actually, it's the fastest key value store I've tested. So this, these are two curves um, showing how, how long it takes to retrieve things, so get and insert things into my B trees. This is not specific to Pihul. It's not particularly optimized for Pihul. The only thing that's uh, related to Pihul is that I'm not implementing long values yet, just because I have, I've never needed to do that. But so here I'm comparing four systems, so four different implementations of key values. Um, the, the most, like the slowest one, is a, a Rust library called SLED. So SLED is super slow, but it's, it's also really, really cool. It's using state-of-the-art technology to, um, to, to do lock-free transactions on a database. So you can have a, a giant computer with thousands of, uh, of cores, or maybe hundreds of cores, more realistically. And your transactions won't block each other, and they will still be uh, uh, have uh, ACID guarantees. So this is super cool, but unfortunately, it's still a research prototype. And so for uh, the kind of stuff I'm doing in a single core, uh, it's not super re relevant. So the green line is the fastest uh, C library, um, LMDB. It's battle tested and all that, and uh, it's claimed to be the, like the fastest possible um, in many places. And now this is uh, Sanakiria. The system I've just uh, introduced, and this is like the uh, orange line is a benchmark of something that cannot be achieved. So this is the standard library, the implementation of uh, B trees in the standard library of Rust, and, and so it doesn't store anything on disk. So if you're storing stuff on disk, it will obviously obviously take more time. So this is just like the reason I've I've uh, added it to, uh, added it there is to just uh, see how close we are to uh, doing that. So we're not paying a lot in order to, to store. St well, this is an SSD drive, of, obviously, but we're not paying a lot because we're not we're minimizing the number of times we're writing and reading uh, to the disk. So, so that's it. Well, the put thing has a similar uh, performance. Uh, removing sleds, we can uh, see it more clearly. So this is well, twice as fast as the fastest uh, C equivalent. Okay, so and it, this was actually unexpected. Like performance was never the goal. Uh, the goal was to just to be able to fork. Um, and initially, I contacted the author of LMDB to uh, get him to introduce a, a fork primitive, but uh, it wasn't. It was apparently impossible in the design, so I had to write my own. Um, all right. So now some announcements. So. Um, a hosting platform, so we, we uh, all like working together, but we don't like setting up servers. So how do we uh, 
collaborate and share repositories. Uh, one, one way to do it in Pirul, and that's been the case since the beginning, is to use um, self-hosted repositories using SSH. But uh, it's not often convenient to have to set up a, a machine in order to work together. So I've wanted to build a, a hosting platform, and I actually built it. Um, the first version was released quite a while ago in uh, 2016. It's using, uh, it's written entirely in Rust, just like uh, Pihul, and, uh, and PostgreSQL to deal with all the user accounts and uh, discussions and text and so on. Uh, it was running for a while on a, sing on a single machine. It went through all the iterations of the Rust uh, asynchronous ecosystem. So uh, that's a lot of refactoring and rewrite and so on. Uh, and it's never been really stable, really. Uh, but the worst time for stability was definitely the OVH uh, Strasbourg dat data center fire in March, March 2021, where my machines... So I've seen a slide yesterday in one of the talks where someone talked about uh, your server being on fire, uh, but I don't think they really mean it. Like, here I do really mean it. Uh, <laughs> like, there was an actual fire in the, the actual data center. And so the machines were down for uh, two weeks, and because it was uh, an experimental prototype, uh, you had no uh, real backups, replications, or anything of the kind in place. So during these two weeks, I took advantage of that little break in my work to... Uh, to rebuild something, to re build a replicated setup using, well, the fact that Pihul is a CRDT itself, so it's easy to replicate. And then I've used Raft, uh, the Raft protocol to replicate Postgres. And at the time, there, there was also convenience because my two largest contributors, like the two largest contributors uh, to Pihul were using the Southern Cross Cable, if you guys know uh, what, what that means. So they were, um, they were communicating with the server in Strasbourg by first going from uh, New Zealand and Australia to uh, uh, San Francisco, and then across the US, across the Atlantic Ocean, uh, and, to, uh, uh, and across France to, to Strasbourg. So uh, they had absolutely uh, unbearable latencies. And so I was able to uh, give them, so this was cool and convenient because it was a, I was finally able to give them a, a proper server with short, uh, short latencies, short response times. But it's been working okay for uh, two years now, uh, a little bit over two years. But the problem is that this is, a, at the moment, it's a personal project. It's totally unfunded, so the machines are really small. And I'm using Postgres in like ways that aren't really intended, because my, the, the, the core of my database is actually Sanakiria and Pihul. It's not, it's not in, stored in, in, Post, in uh, Postgres. So I need to communicate between these two databases. And so I need the databases to be uh, located close to um, they're not like the replica are not just backups. They're, they're backups and caches at the same time. So the consequence of that is that when the machines are under a high, at like too high a load, it causes a, a failure of, of Postgres. So Postgres takes a little more time to in, answer. And, and so the Raft uh, thing understands that as a total failure and it triggers a switchover of the main, uh, like the leader uh, of the cluster. And that would be okay, uh, just having some downtime, right? But actually, the consequence of that is way worse than downtime. It's data loss. So having small, smaller machines is, is fine. I don't mind uh, if some of my users are using my experimental system and it just crashes sometimes or uh, is down for a little while. That, it doesn't really matter. But when they're starting to lose data, that's, that's a problem. So I've decided to uh, rewrite it. Uh, and because I was working on, with Cloudflare workers and function as a service in other projects, and uh, my renewable energy projects, I started thinking about how we could use Pihul uh, to do that. So the, like re really quickly, function as a service is uh, different from traditional architecture where you have a big process overhead or a virtual machine overhead for each, uh, for, for like each little piece of server you're running. Instead of doing that, you're just sharing a machine and sharing just a single giant JavaScript runtime with lots of different uh, processes or functions, and even but even from other users, so Cloudflare uses on like each machine a gi this giant runtime shared by all, all its uh, customers. So that's really cool because uh, you can answer from all of like Cloudflare's 250 data centers, and it gives you optimal latency. Um, and it's also very easy to write. So that's uh, the the minimal example uh, taken from their documentation, where you're just answering a hello worker uh, from like you're responding that to uh, to a request, 
And now the question becomes, like, can we run or at least simulate a peer-hole repository in a pure function-as-a-service framework? Because like, the storage options are fairly limited in function-as-a-service. You don't have access to a, to a hard drive. You don't even have a, an actual machine. So how do you do that? Or at least how do you pretend to be a full-fledged peer-hole repository where, in fact, you're just a, like, some key value store, some replicated, um, eventually consistent key value store in the cloud? So that's the main challenge. It's completely unlike everything I had been uh, like completely at odds with my uh, hypothesis when I uh, first wrote Sanakiria and, and Pihul. It's not no hard drive at all. So the solution is to compile Sanakiria to Wasm because uh, you can run Wasm on on Cloudflare workers, um, and you are storing pseudo memory pages in the storage engine. So instead of instead of using uh, uh, disk sectors, I'm using key, keys and values in, in the in their storage engine. The main uh, the main problem now becomes uh, the, eventually, uh, the eventual consistency. I'm solving that problem by using the multiple heads I talked about earlier, like the multi multiple routes. So I keep the old, older routes because I know that maybe so that, like the changes I'm making to, uh, to my key value store haven't propagated to all of the data centers. So I keep the old routes while they haven't propagated. So Cloudflare guarantees, for example, one minute uh, propagation time. So that's what I use to keep to keep my older older branches in order to avoid like stepping on each other's foot. Uh, so and we don't need a full people like checking dependencies and maintaining maintaining a list of fetches is, is enough. Okay, so some technical details to as like almost my conclusion. Um, so this this service is using TypeScript for web parts, um, Svelte for the UI. And then Rust and Wasm for the people parts. Um, it can be self-hosted, although I've never tested that yet. Uh, using Cloudflare's uh, workers, so they've released their runtime uh, in like as, as an open source project. It's open source, uh, AGPL license, and it will be released progressively because there's a lot, a lot of stuff to release that's currently just uh, experimental and prototypal. And it's starting today. So I've just uh, opened it just before the beginning of this talk. Uh, so now you, can, you guys can connect to uh, nest.behold.org and start uh, like creating an account. And like there's no documentation. Uh, things may crash. Uh, there's probably lots of bugs. Uh, but this will come uh, in the next few days or weeks. Uh, OK, so as a conclusion, uh, this is a new open source version control system based on proper algorithms rather than collections of hacks like uh, we, we've had uh, for some time. Uh, it's scalable to mono repos and large files. It's potentially usable by non coders. The, the like the craziest, like the the farthest stretch I, I've seen uh, in discussions in that project is using it uh, as a, as a tool to help parliaments do their jobs. So parliaments are uh, giant version control systems operated manually by uh, highly qualified and highly paid lawyers. Who are paid to like check the consistency of the lo lo the lo logical consistency of the of the law, but actually spend uh, a significant share of their time actually editing word documents to apply changes that have been voted voted by member of parliament. So they're doing manual version control and they're wasting lots of time on that. And I, I've collaborated the, with the French parliament, uh, which would have been a good test case because we're not actually using our parliament at the time. Like the cabinet passes their bills uh, as they wish. Uh, so. <laughs> It's, it's like the test mode of, uh, of, of an API. Uh, it's, it can be usable by artists, by, uh, I've talked to lawyers as well, um, by uh, maybe Sonic Pi composers. We had a really cool uh, discussions last night about that. And maybe why not by uh, Lego builders wanting to uh, build larger projects. The hosting service is available since today, I've said that. And another conclusion uh, is, it's a, it's a personal conclusion of mine. So I have a tendency to do work in way too many things at the same time, but uh, and, and, and it never works. Well, until it does. Like, for example, here working on uh, electricity sharing at the same time as, um, as a version control helped me see how these would fit together and uh, share ideas ac across, across projects. So to conclude, I would like to acknowledge uh, some, of my, some of my co-authors and contributors, so Florent Becker for all the uh, uh, discussions, inspirations, and early contributions. So Tank Feeder, so uh, that's the uh, most patient tester I've ever seen. Um, he's still there after many years, uh, patient, patiently checking all my bugs, so uh, huge thanks to him. Rohan Hart and uh, Chris Bailey, uh, though Rohan Hart and uh, Angus Finch are um, actually the two folks using the uh, Southern Cross Cable. 
uh, and they've contributed like really cool stuff to people and Chris uh, Bailey uh, who helped bridge the gap between lawyers and uh, or legal people and, and uh, what, what I'm doing. All right, so thanks for your attention.